uh, thank you for the introduction and thanks the organizer for allowing me to speak here. And I also want to thank Natalie for giving us an uh, excellent introduction into what leakage error is, the damage it can cause, the solution to it, and for hyping up my talk. So, um, and today um, my talk is mainly going to be about how leakage error is actually very, very hardware dependent, and the solution to it will also likely to be very, very, very hardware dependent if you want an uh, efficient solution. So as the title suggests, uh, it's going to be a silicon surface core architecture that will be resilient against leakage error. This is uh, a joint work between uh, me and Simon with uh, many of our colleagues here in uh, UCL, and it is also supported by Quantum Motion, which is a silicon cubic company based here in London. So first of all, what is silicon spin qubits? So in case you missed uh, Jelma's uh, excellent introduction in Monday, I will just briefly talk about silicon spin qubit here. So there are various kind of quantum computer platforms. Uh, you are more familiar maybe with uh, super kinetic qubit. Here's a picture from Google. Or trail bion qubit. Here's a picture from UMD. And now I'm going to talk about silicon qubit, a picture from QTech here. Uh, silicon qubit. The most simplest one is uh, mapping the spin of a single electron to the zero and one state. So how do we isolate this single electron? It can be via trapping them in the quantum dots or via uh, using the electrons in impurity atoms in silicon. But in today's talk, I'm going to just mainly focus on the quantum dot case. So in the quantum dot, basically, if you have uh, this kind of uh, semiconductor heterostructure at the interface, you will have some uh, two-dimensional electron gas. And then if you put some gate electron on top of it, you can create a potential well which can trap the electrons. Then you can apply a constant magnetic field to split the degeneracy of the spin-up and spin-down spa uh, spin spin state. Uh, in this case, you can create uh, your quantum dot spin qubits. So, uh, first thing you guys will be interested in is what is the gate fle fidelity of this kind of qubits? So for single qubit gate, um, it can be exceeding 99.9% .9 nowadays. And for two qubit gate, there is a recent very nice paper from uh, Zurex group that showed that you can do 98% uh, control rotation gates. Uh, this is, of course, uh, a bit lagging behind more mature platform like superconducting qubits and ion trap qubits. Uh, but the reason we're interested in the silicon qubit is, of course, its uh, potential promises in scalability. Uh, this is mainly due to the fact that it's of all electrical control, so you can actually uh, tune and calibrate uh, all those quantum dots and interaction much, much easier. You can even use uh, other techniques like feedback and uh, machine learning and stuff like that to uh, calibrate and control them. Second of all, it's potentially compatible with all the commercial fabrication process in semiconductor industry. So this means that uh, Potentially, if you can make a small chip very well, then the cost and the technology uh, to scale it up can be very, very favorable. Third of all, it will have very, very high qubit density. It can go up to 10 to 9 qubit per uh, square centimeter. So why scalability is important? It's because of the sheer number of qubits uh, we need to perform a fault tolerant compu quantum computation. For example, to factor 2,000 bit number using Shor's algorithm in eight hours, there's a recent paper from Krakeny and Akras which shows that you need tens of billions of qubits. Uh, tens of millions, sorry. Billions will be <laughs> crazy. <laughs> uh, so the the uh, most practical way nowadays uh, when we try to scale up a qubit platform is, of course, uh, surface code. This is mainly because it's a uh, high threshold and it's 2D layout. Uh, as shown here, the black qubit, uh, black dots are just the data qubit, while the different color plaquettes are just the parity check, the S and Z parity check we need to perform on the data qubits. And 
this surface code is also very, very favorable uh, for silicon qubits because this kind of grid 2D perpendicular layout is very, very compatible with the commercial fabrication process. So up to now, everything seems very good. Like you, if you build a silicon qubit, you just scale it up. Everything is very nice, but the story is not so big because there are still some challenges in the scaling up the silicon qubit. So the first challenge you will face is due to the dense packing of uh, the control line. So as you can see here in these devices, to create these uh, two quantum ducts here to trap the qubits, you need all these control lines to come in into the plane to uh, perform interactions or create the quantum dot uh, potential. So the number of qubits we can create will proportional to the area of the chip, while the number of control line we can fit in is actually just pr proportional to the side length of the chip. So of course, when you try to scale up the chip, uh, the spaces for the control line will be more and more limited. So this is the first challenge we face. Of course, you can say, um, maybe we can just space out all the quantum dots, but uh, it's not this easy because uh, the quantum dot re relies on short range exchange interaction to mediate their interaction, so you cannot just uh, space out all the dots to fit in more control lines. So one of the solutions to this is a uh, shared control line, which is uh, proposed by Veltos uh, et al., uh, this kind of crossbar architecture. Uh, because in surface code, we have lots of operation in the stabilizer chip that are translational invariant. So of course, you can use a single control line to control all these uh, uh, similar operation. So in this case, uh, you may use a very small number of control line to control the whole uh, silicon as the whole s surface code stabilizer check. And uh, Li et al. also expand on this scheme and um, adapt this to a half view uh, quantum dot array, which will e allow even more control line to fit in. Uh, the main challenge of this kind of approach is because uh, quantum dots are artificial, uh, artificial atoms. So uh, in this case, uh, you cannot actually make them into an absolute perfect uh, degree of homogeneity. But this shared control line kind of approach actually uh, requires quite a high degree of homogeneity, which can be quite challenging at the present technology. The second way to deal with this control line packing problem is to use a modular kind of approach. So this modular kind of approach, in this case, was proposed by Bunako et al. They put each qubit in a each data qubit in a module and connect all the data qubit using this kind of shuttling highways. And this shuttling highway, what they do is they shuttle electrons around to mediate the uh, inter-module gate uh, between all the data qubits. And in this case, uh, you can actually provide a lot of spaces, uh, in this case, microns, uh, for all the control lines to fit in, and even all the control devices, uh, all the measurement devices, and things like that. The problem with this case is, of course, uh, shuttling electrons across module will um, require more time, and also the gate fidelity might be more limited by uh, than the other approaches. And a common problem that all the architecture I mentioned above did not mention is the problem of leakage error. So a brief introduction of the leakage error here in case you missed the talk before the break. Uh, the leakage error is just when your quantum system escape out of your uh, computational subspace that used to define the qubits. So in superconducting qubits, this can mean uh, it escape out of the lowest two energy level that are used to define your qubits, or in trap ion qubits, it's very similar. It's the metastable sta states that you, you use uh, to define your qubits. Uh, for single electron spin qubits, however, it's a tiny bit different. Uh, this, the leakage error we'll focus on is actually a charge leakage error, which the charge can go out of the potential well and you are left with an empty well with nothing or there is an additional charge uh, going into a well, and you have two charges. And this can 
mainly happens when you're trying to tune the potential landscape. For example, when you try to perform a two cubic gates by lowering the tunneling barrier, or when you are trying to perform some shutting uh, operation. Mm, leakage error, as mentioned before, was uh, cannot be corrected by quantum error correction code. Thus, if you don't actively uh, do something with it, it can accumulate and eventually corrupt your logical operation, uh, logical information. So some previous way to deal with leakage error, first of all, is uh, leakage detection. So in this circuit, uh, regardless of what the state of uh, the data qubit is, the ancillary qubit will always get flipped, and you will always measure one. However, if the data qubit is leaked, and you also further assume that the control not gate will interact trivially with a leak qubit, then in this case, uh, the ancillary qubit will not get flipped, and you can actually detect leakage using this kind of circuit layout. It was proposed by Preskill and Gottsman. And the second type um, was mentioned in Natalie's talk was uh, leakage reduction. So the simplest picture for leakage le reduction is just uh, you have a data and ancilla and you perform a swap on it uh, and then you use the ancilla as a new data and use the data as the new ancilla. And for the trivial case, uh, this action just means uh, identity. However, for the leakage case, if, uh, the leak if the swap gate cannot transfer the leakage, then the leak data qubit will become a leak data. Ancilla, and the ancilla will just be the new data qubit, which means that the leakage in the data is restored. So in this case, you don't even have to detect whether the leakage happens or not. You just bl blindly apply this, and the leakage in the data will get removed. However, there are limitations to both of the approaches I mentioned. Uh, the first reason is because they did not consider the so-called nightmare scenario. <laughs> So the, they assume two cubic gate does not transfer leakages. But this does not uh, apply to the charge leakage error in silicon, because if you have an empty well and you have a few well, you try to interact them by lowering the potential barrier, that kind of thing. The charge will just have some probability of tunneling through, and the charge leakage may get uh, transferred in this case. And second of all, they did not explicitly mention how you restore the leftover leakage error, uh, leftover leak qubit, because um, in many of the cases, they just say, oh, we initialized it. Uh, but in the case of charge leakage error, uh, really initialize it actually means that you need to have a charge reservoir right next to it that provide the additional charges. Otherwise, it's just an empty well inside of a lot of few quantum dots that you cannot do nothing, you can do nothing. So this kind of uh, potential, uh, this kind of charge reservoir required is actually quite hard to fit in this kind of dense array of qubit because, and this is in additional of the uh, classical control line packing problem that we mentioned earlier. So, uh, uh, so in summary, there are two problems, classical control line fitting, and how do we actually can re store this kind of leakage error in the silicon architecture. Our solution is actually um, quite simple, actually. So what we do is we actually introduce elongated mediator quantum dots to mediate the two qubit interaction for the uh, whole quantum dot array. So of course, when you introduce this kind of mediator quantum dot, it automatically space out the data dot and the ancilla dots, so they provide more spaces to fit in all the control lines and all the classical electronics. Second of all, uh, the additional electrons in these uh, mediator quantum dots can re actually relax into uh, the quantum well uh, in the into the quantum dots if the quantum dot is leaked. So it can actually have a passive uh, pathway to restore this kind of leakage in the qubit quantum dots. So let's uh, take a closer look of what I mean. So this is the architecture that we propose. Uh, the black dots are the data qubits, while the white double dots are the ancillary qubit, which you will see later why it's a double dot instead of a single dot. 
And this uh, elec elongated mediator qubit, which we call jelly bean for obvious reason, uh, will space out all the data qubit and all the ancillary qubit to provide spaces for the measurement devices and all the uh, electron reservoir in within all this qubit array, as you can see here. So uh, we here also highlight a stabilizer plaquette, just for illustration. Uh, the typical length scale of this kind of uh, separation is around like 400 nanometer. And one thing to note is this is different from the modular structure that I mentioned before, but because this does not involve any shuttling of electrons. These uh, quantum dots are all confined quantum dots with defined um, electron configuration. Uh, there is no electron moving around here other than the passive relaxation of the uh, charges into a leak qubit. So the mediated exchange interaction is illustrated here. The mediator dots are evenly occupied quantum dots, and here we only show the two outermost energy level. So then the data and NCI qubit are singly occupied quantum dots. The me, uh, interaction is mediated by a virtual hopping of the uh, electrons in the data and ancillary qubits onto the mediator dots. And we'll denote the energy cause of the such uh, virtual hopping to be, uh, to be delta. So the uh, mediated exchange interaction strength is actually proportional to the inverse square of delta. So if we want to turn on the mediated exchange interaction, we just align the energy level of the mediator dot with the data and ancillary dots. While if we want to turn off the interaction, we want to increase delta, so we raise uh, the energy level of the mediator uh, dot. And as I mentioned, if the data dots get leaked, so if a charge get missing, uh, there will be a charge realization process from the mediator do dots into the data dots. And this charge realization process will be much, much faster than uh, other operation time scale because the charge degree of freedom is much easier to couple to the environment than the spin degree of freedom. And also, uh, you can see here, I did not mention any leakage area due to the double electron uh, occupation. This is because of the fact that our data dot and ancilla dots are very, very small of the 40 and 50 nanometer scale. And the electron-electron repulsion in this kind of uh, small quantum dots uh, is actually much, much larger than other energy scale of our operation. So we did not consider the double occupant uh, double occupancy leakage error. So, of course, uh, you can see here, if uh, we, can, we can immediately transfer this leakage to the mediator dots and our data and cell will be fine. However, if we, here we have a missing charge in the mediator and if we use this mediator for the next round, or like if this mediator is to be used uh, in, the, yeah, in the next cycle, then of course this will also cause ad additional error or even uh, other charge might hop onto this and there will be a propagation of leakage and nightmare scenario again. And so what do we, but looking back into our architecture, it's very nice that uh, all our mediator are just right next to a reservoir. So we can simply reset uh, this mediator with the reservoir. And the fact that uh, electrons in the mediator does not contain any quantum information also means that this reset process uh, will not introduce any errors into our qubit array. So the process just happens like this if we have a leakage in the NCR qubits here, for, for example. Uh, the electron in the mediator dot will get relaxed uh, into the NCR qubits, so one of them will get uh, leaked. And then we turn on the interaction of the reservoir with these uh, two mediators, and in this case the leakage can get removed by the reservoir. So how do we fit this into the stabilizer check cycle? So as you can see here, we actually divide the whole stabilizer, uh, the whole stabilizer into the, uh, of the surface code into four partitions, uh, each denoted by different colors, and we'll perform them sequence by, uh, in sequence. And the reason we do this is because, as you can see, within each 
partition. All these plicates are separated by some inactive plicates. And in this case, if a leakage error happens in these plicates, uh, the errors due to this plicate can, uh, can actually not be, uh, cannot be propagated into the other plicate because all these plicates are inactive. And at the same time, uh, uh, the, the mediator here might be used to restore the data qubit here, so the mediator here might get leaked, but at the same time, we will also reset all this uh, inactive cricket, so that uh, any leakage errors in this inactive cricket due to the current action of this active cricket will not, um, will not leave until the next cycle when we are uh, trying to active activate this inactive percat. So in this kind of way, we can actually constrain our leakage, uh, the, all the errors due to our leakage error within single percat. So let's see how does uh, single percat works. So this is a picture of our single percat. Uh, data qubit, double dot and zero qubit, and elongated uh, mediator qubits. And this, uh, the reason we use this double dot, you can see from the stabilizer check circuit we have here, is because this kind of double dots, if we initialize them into a, a single state, then they can actually uh, det uh, detect the uh, X and Z error of uh, all these um, data qubit by transforming into a triplet state. And in the end, we can actually e easily read out this kind of singular and triplet state via Pauli exclusion principle. So trying to uh, tunnel, the quant uh, tunnel both uh, qubits onto one dot to see if it can happen. So the easy, the reason, uh, so because we can read them out easily, we use uh, this kind of double dots. So this was originally also used in the architecture proposed by Jones and Valderholz, but in those cases, they treat these uh, double dots as one main qubits that interact with four and one reference qubit that are used for readout only. In this case, we actually treat them as equal. Uh, the advantage of this uh, kind of approach is that you can actually have simultaneous interaction of different data qubits with an ancilla, as you can see here. So, uh, one and three can interact with the ancilla at the same time uh, without affecting each other, while two and four can also interact uh, with the ancilla at the same time without uh, affecting each other. So, in this case, uh, the stabilizer check cycle can actually uh, get half the time needed. And of course, we also need to break all this CZ gate into our elementary gates. So here, we break it down into one of the canonical uh, gate set that uh, silicon qubit have, which is partial swaps and single qubit poly rotation. Uh, the good thing here is uh, this Z gate, as uh, mentioned by Mike Kai's uh, talks earlier, uh, can actually be, this one can be applied in a virtual way, while this one, if you apply on the ancilla, you can use the fact that this singlet is uh, invariant under the uh, symmetric operation, the, the exchange symmetry doesn't change, that you can remove them. So this can simplify our circuit further. And after we know what the uh, circuit is, we can uh, start to discuss about uh, the error models that we want to put in into this uh, stabilizer check circuit. So the two qubit gates we have, uh, control Z gate, which compose of two square root of swaps. So here we'll assume uh, each square root of swap will have the probability of P2 over 2 that having a swap error and due to fluctuations in the interaction strength or fluctuation in the interaction uh, time. And we'll assume that the single qubit gate initialization and readout will have a depolarizing error of the probability that is uh, 0 0.1 of the two qubit gate error. Um, for the leakage event, as you can see from the picture here, our plicat can actually be further divided into two non-interacting half before the readout. So we will assume that leakage events only happen when we try to apply two qubit gate because that's when we try to change our uh, electrical poten potential. 
And if we assume each two qubit gates will have a leakage probability of PK, uh, P leak, then uh, each half of the stabilizer will assume that one such leakage happen. We will assume the worst case that the whole half get depolarized. And in this case, uh, each half will have a 2p leak probability of get depolarized because there are two, two qubit interaction here to a first, uh, first order approximation. And so now we can find the threshold given that we have uh, the, the circuit and the error models. And we also know that uh, all the error can, are contained within single plicats. And as you all of you would know, uh, above threshold means that um, more physical qubit will introduce more errors or ineffective uh, error correction, while below threshold, you can actually um, reduce the logical error rate in indefinitely by scaling up your code. So this is the simulation we've done. Uh, the, uh, the, the circumstances here is we actually first try the case without leakage error, and we find that the threshold is the normal threshold, unsurprisingly, uh, around 7%, uh, which is of the canonical case, like 0.5 to 1%, depends on the decoder and error models, and et cetera, you use. So vertical axis is the logical error rate, while the horizontal axis is the two cubic gate error rate. And for different code sizes, as you can see below this crossing point, uh, you can decrease your logical error by increasing the size of your code. But now if we bring in uh, the leakage error rates, so we try to fix uh, the, uh, the gate error rate to a reasonable amount of 0.5%, uh, which is uh, below the threshold here, but still uh, reasonable, then you will find a thresh leakage threshold of 0.23%. Uh, so you can actually still tolerate uh, quite a fair amount of leakage error uh, given uh, this realistic amount of uh, gate error. And the leakage uh, error threshold can actually reach 0.66% uh, if you deal away with all the gate error. So actually you can see here that actually the damage due to leakage error here is not that much more damaging than the gate error. So via our scheme, which is a combination of all the hardware, uh, hardware solution we have and the stabilizer cycle we de design, we actually manage uh, to reduce the leakage error damage to a similar level of the gate error damage. So a summary. So as I mentioned, ceiling qubit has uh, all these uh, wonderful things uh, about scaling uh, scalability. However, there are challenges in unpacking this con classical control line and the leakage uh, errors in, and solving the leakage error in the uh, silicon quantum dot qubits. So our solution is via introducing uh, the mediator dots to provide an additional electron source into the uh, qubit array and also provide additional spaces. And also we design a stabilizer cycle and a mediator reset cycle to remove all the correlation of errors due to leakage uh, in our devices. And the result is the damage of the leakage error is reduced to a comparable level as uh, the standard gate error in this case. So this kind of architecture can actually be a potential practical way to actually implement a scalable uh, surface code in the silicon architecture. So the main take home message that I want to say is actually that leakage error are very, very hardware dependent and the most effective solution to it are also likely to be hardware-based. So, I mean, it's of course very fruitful to uh, investigate all the circuit level ideas to how to deal with them, but in the end, um, maybe one also want to take some time to think what kind of uh, architectural solution one can bring into solving this leakage error problem, as in this case, there is no additional uh, circuit level maneuver in, um, in our model, we are just introducing the mediated dots and using it, to trans using it to transfer all the leakage into mediated dots and then use the reservoir to remove. So this kind of passive pathway, pathway uh, that's specific to architecture can actually be a very, very fruitful area to uh, 
discover in the leakage error area, just like uh, what Natalie has mentioned earlier about mixing two kind of uh, ion qubits to deal with leakage error. I think uh, we should uh, take more serious consideration in that kind of direction. Thanks. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, we can take some questions. Uh, thanks, nice talk. Um, if you go back like a few slides to where you have the thresholds, yep. I was wondering if you had uh, looked at like some sort of ratio of like leakage to two qubit gate error and pound thresholds in that direction as well, as opposed to like fixing one and looking at the other. Uh, not really, because the main reason is because w why we want to uh, vary the whole amount of threshold, uh, like fix one and try to find the threshold of uh, other, the other is because there is no uh, really good number about the leakage probability of the silicon architecture at the moment. So we actually want to fix the thing into a practical, the gate error into a practical level and actually just find its tolerance. And when those numbers come out, then you can see that uh, how this can be compared to our number here. All right, thanks. Any other questions? Okay. I've got one. Um, so you said earlier about the inhomogeneity of the quantum dots you can create being a bit of a problem for this yeah. parallel control, you know, like if you want to have like a yeah, yeah, sparse yeah. control lines. Yeah. Do the mediator dots add like another you know, dimension to this? Do you see this being a problem in like a, I might have missed something you were saying about some mitigating factor to this, just like more dots that you have to have, uh, you know, with the same properties and if you want oh, to sorry. You, you mean, you, do you mean that how does uh, our architecture deal with this uh, homogeneity problem or? Yeah. Oh, I see. So the reason, so uh, this kind of homogeneity problem in uh, quantum dots is one of the way to deal with it is uh, the main inhomogeneity can be due to the G factor variation, which can lead to different Zeeman splitting if you apply the same view. So in those kind of cases, uh, what you do, one of the ways you do it is you apply uh, additional uh, gate potential, which will cause a start, start shift, which will modify your G factor. So that's done during the calibration process. And the reason why those kind of approach is hard to, uh, maybe it's too far away, it's hard to uh, do in the share control line cases is because they share a control line, so you cannot tune individual one. But in our cases, because we provide these additional spaces, you can actually not use the share control line thing. You just like, have a single gate electrode for each individual dot. Then you can deal with the inhomogeneity in those kind of way. OK, thank you. Yeah. More questions? Um, I have one. So in terms of practically doing this in the lab, do you foresee any challenges? Like having these extra double quantum dots, does it change the coherence properties of your Yes, uh, that's a very good question. So th the, prop the main challenge of this kind of approach uh, at the current stage is, of course, this kind of uh, mediated exchange interaction is uh, much, much uh, less as broad than the direct exchange interaction in the community. But I don't see any fundamental reason that there is uh, should be lower uh, controllability or those kind of thing. In fact, uh, if you try to do uh, the direct exchange interaction using uh, modified the tunneling gate potential, uh, those kind of thing can be a bit challenging in a way that if you try to modify the tunneling potential because the space is so small. Uh, the gate electro required for that is actually very, very small. Well, in this case, when you space it out, you are actually just modifying the potential of this whole large dots here. But I can't really say like which one is better or, uh, or worse, but I would definitely say that, uh, I would definitely say that uh, they will each have their own advantage. Uh, but one of the other things that uh, everyone should take uh, with a grain of salt with this kind of mediated exchange interaction is it can be uh, slower 
than the direct exchange interaction because it's of a higher order perturbation theory. Uh, the reason we don't worry about that in this uh, in the silicon architecture at the moment is because the bottleneck of the gate speed is mainly the single qubit gate, which is of the megahertz level. So even though this is slower, it's still not slower than the single qubit gate. So in that kind of case, it won't be the bottleneck of our operation. Great, thank you. Yeah. So if we don't have any more questions, that's time to speak again.